Should record. Great. Okay. Hello. Hello again. Um, welcome to this webinar, Native Plants and Their Viral Foes. We have Dr. Tessa Shates here to present for us. Um, my name is Samantha Young. I'm the education manager at the Anza Borrego Foundation, and I'm going to be your host, where I'll just give a brief introduction. I'll hand it over to Tessa, she'll present, and then at the end, I'll, I'll kind of help moderate some of the questions, the Q&A. Um, but she's really your, she is your presenter today, Tessa. So, um, Tessa, can you pull up our first slide, please? Thank you. So this, webinar is part of a series called Anza Borrego in Focus. And we host a few webinars or online lectures, and we're hoping to do more and more of these. But also during the desert season, which runs October through May, we have in-person lectures and field trips. Um, so into the field, into Anza Borrego, where we have presenters come give a lecture, give a talk about a topic, and then take participants out to explore a particular ecosystem or a particular organism or group of species. And so we, we cover all sorts of things with this series. Uh, feel free to stay tuned um, to keep following us if you're interested in, in seeing some of the other topics that we have lined up. A little bit about Anza Brago, just in case some of you are new to this organization. We, the Anza Brago Foundation has been around since 1967. So we're not, we're not exactly new. Um, a little bit newer though, is the fact that we are the official nonprofit partner of Anza, Des Anza Brago Desert State Park. So this means that we purchase private land in and around the park for conservation through our land acquisition program. We provide direct park support financially and by supporting relevant research in Anza Brago. And we connect the public to desert resources through a variety of in-person and online education programs. So one of those programs I just want to briefly mention, Tessa, can you go to the ne next slide? Um, so there's our mission. That's what I said. Can you go to the next slide after that? Thank you. Um, so this is our, uh, our scholarship program. We actually offer three scholarships. Uh, one of them is in archaeology, so I'm not mentioning that here. It's a little bit of a different topic, but we have two scholarships in ecology and conservation. That's the Howie Weir Conservation Award and the Paul Jorgensen Research Grant. And Tessa was the recipient of the Howie Weir Conservation Award, which is how we got in touch and uh, I invited her to come present on the research that she did using those grant funds. Um, other programs that we offer are all sorts of uh, in guided hikes, um, adventures, off-road tours. We're developing a brand new school field trip program, um, a teacher professional development program. Uh, we do research symposia and many more things. So we are really active in the community and in Borrego Springs and Anza Borrego Desert State Park, really trying to bring, trying to connect the public to this incredible resource that we have here in Anza Borrego. Um, if you are not familiar with us, I invite you, there's my chat, to um, check us out. I'm going to post a link to our website in the chat right there, theabf.org. Um, feel free to check us out whenever you like. And I'll be posting other relevant links into the chat as we go throughout the evening. So let's on to this webinar. We're really excited about this first webinar in our series, Beat the Heat with Cool Webinars. Um, so it's a little bit too hot in Anza Brego to have in-person programs. I'm here now and um, it's okay walking from shady spot to shady spot, but in the sun, it's really quite, it's really quite extreme, quite intense. Um, but we wanted to continue to bring research and content your way from the comfort of your own home in spots that are hopefully a little bit cooler. Uh, so I am curious to start 
how some of you found this, um, where are we? How some of you found this webinar. I'm gonna really quickly launch a poll right here. And if anyone listening wouldn't mind just responding to the poll right now in Zoom, I'm curious to hear. Um, just so that we can, for the future, we can get an idea of how the word is spreading and then hopefully start to spread the word a little bit further. Cool. Oh, awesome. Okay, thanks so much everyone for answering. I think that's everybody. Um, we have, I don't know if you guys can see these responses, but. We have some people from the ABF website, um, from a friend, and from the ABF eConnection, which is our general mailer that we send out every few weeks. Thank you. Oh, here you can see those results. I don't know if that's interesting, but let's keep going. Um, okay, so now on to our main event. Tonight's presenter is Dr. Tessa Shates, and she's going to talk about her PhD work in entomology from the University of California at Riverside, which she completed in December of 2021. The overarching theme of her work was insect transmitted plant viruses in the agricultural and urban natural interface. She used a combination of field work, molecular techniques and greenhouse experiments to better understand the dynamics between the insect vectors, drought adapted perennial plants and plant viruses. So in 2019 was when Tessa was awarded the Howie Weir Memorial Conservation Grant from the Anza Brego Foundation. And she used this to describe the virus communities that were harbored in three target plants, buffalo gourd, coyote melon and sacred thorn apple. Currently, Tessa is a scientist in R&D, infectious disease at Quest Diagnostics, where she works with a very different kind of bug. And I also just wanted to mention that along with Tessa, we have her PhD advisor here with us today, and that is Dr. Carrie Mock, who is an associate professor in the Department of Entomology at UC Riverside. Just a word about that. So the mock lab is housed in the Department of Entomology at UC Riverside. And there they study the ecology and evolution of insect transmitted plant pathogens and their vectors across wild urban and wild agriculture interfaces. So their favorite microbes are plant viruses, which you're gonna hear all about today, and some bacteria as well. They also love some insects like aphids, white flies, and psyllids. Um, so we are so pleased to have both Tessa and Carrie joining us today and presenting on a topic that might be a little bit niche, but is so important to Anza Brego, as well as each and every one of us and our gardens and indoor plants and the food that we eat. So without further ado, may I present Dr. Tessa Shates. Okay, I'll take over for now. Thank you for that introduction and all the background information on the Anza Brego Foundation. I'm really excited to share my work from my PhD research today. So a little bit more about myself. I did my undergraduate degree at UC Irvine and I started my research career working with tritrophic interactions, which means the interactions between a plant an herbivore and its predator. So I started with canola and aphids. So I've been working with aphids since 2012 or 2013 for a long time now, and ladybugs and uh, parasitoid wasps. And I was studying how the chemistry of the plant interacted with the downstream herbivore and predator. So after graduating, I did um, an internship in Corvallis, Oregon with the, a field research group, the Northwest Entomology Research Center. And we were looking at arthropod biodiversity um, at different levels of herbicidal spray in forestry clear cuts. And then after my internship was done, I uh, volunteered at the Los Angeles County Natural History Museum in their entomology department describing um, the biodiversity of 
tiny flies called scuttleflies where I had the opportunity to uh, actually have one of the flies named after me because I participated in identifying it. So that was my background uh, during undergrad, directly after. And from there, I started uh, my PhD at UC Riverside in uh, the mock lab. And I started with a focus on chemical ecology because my background was looking at the chemistry of interactions between plants and herbivores. And I wanted to have the flavor of plant viruses with that. But what happens to a lot of PhD students is our projects change. So clearly based on the topic, I'm not presenting on that, but instead my work with uh, aphid-borne plant viruses in um, wild systems. So now I'm a scientist at Quest, as um, Samantha mentioned, doing work with a different bug. But I'm not talking about today, that today I'm talking about my research with uh, plant viruses. So we as humans are changing our planet. We are doing this through trade and travel and globalization, and also through developing land for homes, for our roads, and for our food production, so agriculture. And there are consequences to these human activities. Habitat loss is a great threat to plants and animals, many of which are at risk of extinction. And there are also unexpected consequences beyond the obvious loss of species and land. We have hitchhiking microbes going from one region to another like these plant viruses on the screen right now. And this ties into agricultural expansion because wild plant communities are the ones that are uh, exposed to these novel moving around pathogens. Land use is intensifying and conversion is also continuing with a lot of our ice-free land already converted to agriculture. And the remaining land are uh, fragmented habitats. And these fragments have more edges. And these edges are more prone to invasion from plants, animals, and microbes. One second, water. And this interaction zone is called the agroecological interface. And that's where crops and that wild remnant vegetation are interacting. And this is happening along an ecological continuum. So there isn't a strict border between agriculture and development. There's agriculture, then we have our home gardens, fallow lands, and then wild land. So there isn't a, a clear cut. And however, there is a clear cut in what we do know about these systems. And we know a lot about viruses in crop systems, how they move between plants and how they're transmitted around different crops. But we know a little bit less, but we still have explored how wild plants are sources of viruses that move into crops. And then the next on what we know, which we still know very little about, is what plant viruses are doing in natural systems, how they're circulating and moving about. What we know the least about Nearly nothing is how agricultural activities and those associated agricultural viruses are impacting wild plants. So here's a clear research gap that I started my work with. So I'd like for everyone to go to that link um, and answer the question that will pop up when we try and figure it out. So this is a poll and we're going to, if I can, get to, I can't find, hold on, there we go. All right, so I'm going to activate this poll. So if you go to that link, we should be able to see um, what people think of when they think of plant viruses, because today might have been your first day hearing about them or even contemplating them for more than a couple of seconds. Yellow leaves, okay, cool. We've got one response. And don't be fooled, my name is not Julia Shates. This is actually my sister's um, 
poll account. She's really savvy with this. And I was just able to mooch off of her. All right, we've got one response. I'll wait just a couple more seconds. Because this is a good one. Okay. Wilting, good, good. I have a feeling this may have been a surprise to add in the um, poll, but <laughs> okay, get cool, dry, yes, dry, wilting, problematic. Oh wait, a couple more seconds. All right, I'm going to deactivate the poll for now and um, keep on going, but let me see if we can get this back. Okay, so we've contemplated them. Now I'll tell you what they are. So a plant virus is essentially um, a hard shell, so that package, and inside we have uh, nucleic acid or uh, the genetic code. Th these are the instructions for replication, but a virus can't do anything on its own. It requires a host. Without a host, a plant virus is unable to reproduce itself. It needs materials and it needs energy and enzymes to, to um, reproduce. So only inside a host, can this plant virus replicate? What does the virus do in the plant? So the virus needs to be in living cells. And from those living cells, it can move throughout the plant and in fact, most tissues. Pictured here is a cultivated squash and melon infected with two different squash viruses. So whoever put yellow leaves in the word cloud, excellent. Wilting, also great. These are some really deformed looking leaves. On the right is uh, an image where you can see the leaves and the, the plant are all fluorescent. And this is a virus that's been tagged with fluorescence. And you can see how it's distributed all throughout that plant. But beyond existing in the plant, the virus can also cause big changes to plant physiology. Here is a picture on the left, you can see there's two plants. These are both the same age. They're both bottle gourds. One of them I, infect, I infected with a virus called cucumber mosaic virus, and the other one I did not infect. You can see the clear difference in size between an infected and uninfected plant. On the right is a picture of melons infected with another uh, squash virus, so you can see that yellowing. And Below that are a bunch of cucumbers that come from a virus infected cucumber plant. At this point, you might be wondering, oh, if the fruit are infected, could that mean that a plant virus can infect humans? That is not the case. Uh, plant viruses require transmission uh, into the living cell and plants have cell walls different from humans, which have cell membranes. So plant viruses are not going to be infecting humans. Don't worry. However, there are still impacts from uh, plant virus infections. These viruses can kill plants. And uh, depending on if you're using those plants for agriculture or subsistence, that can have economic um, impact or it can have food security impacts, which can exacerbate an already a uh, difficult situation where food security, you know, isn't uh, ideal. Uh, viruses can't infect people, but they can infect multiple plant species and move between one species to another. They, use, they require oftentimes insects as their transportation devices. So um, some insects that transmit viruses include aphids, a common garden pest, um, white flies and leaf hoppers. So you, you probably have seen these at some point on some of your plants at home um, or just out and about. 
what happens here and how agriculture is relevant to this whole interaction is that in our crop habitats, we have a large amount of very tasty edible plants that these insects can take advantage of and they can build to large numbers and viruses are circulating in these systems. So when we call the plants at the end of the season or when we have a large enough amount of insects, these insects will fly um, long distances off into wild habitats. So the big questions are, what crop viruses are moving into wild habitats? And are they sticking around and infecting wild plant hosts? If so, what are they doing in these hosts? So there's evidence that crop viruses may be reducing survival and reproduction in long-lived wild grasses um, by reducing the seed and flower production. So over multiple seasons, these plants will lose out on um, reproduction and survival. However, crop viruses might also be helping wild plants deal with other stressors. For example, there's the situation where um, squash beetles can transmit a bacterial pathogen, and they do this by eating wild pumpkin. They like to eat in the flowers, and they transmit this pathogen by defecating. They're pooping in the flowers, and when the wild pumpkin becomes infected with the bacteria, they rapidly wilt and die. However, when they're infected with a crop virus, they produce fewer flowers, and this provides fewer opportunities for the beetle to feed and defecate at the same time on the flowers. So the wild pumpkins are less likely to be contracting this bacteria, wilting, and dying. For today's tale, I'll be talking about pathogen pollution in native plants. And these native plants are taking place, the setting of the story and the, these native plants are in the California desert and chaparral ecoregions. So this may not be a surprise, but California has rich diversity of habitat and a lot of these have drought adapted perennial plants. And also, as well as prime chaparral desert habitat, we also have prime agricultural habitat. California produces over a third of the country's vegetables and two thirds of the country's fruits and nuts. So we have both wild areas, and a lot of them, and also a lot of agriculture. So you can see how the stage is being set. My questions are, what insect transmitted pathogens are moving into desert and chaparral? And where did they come from? And what impacts are they having on the wild plants? Um, so here I'll introduce the characters to the story. There's three host plants. The first is Cucurbita fetidissima, or commonly known as buffalo gourd. This is a plant that is eaten by herbivores and has historical use by native people in the Southwest. The leaves and fruit are edible and the roots are useful for uh, as soap. These plants also provide homes for rodents and ants where ants walk across as highways. I've seen a lot of native uh, fire ants on this plant and the next plant. So cucurbita palmata or coyote melon is also eaten by herbivores in uh, desert and chaparral. So insects, rodents and birds but not by people. Lastly, we have the only plant that is not a squash. The other two are in the squash family. This one, Datura ridei, or sacred thorn apple, is uh, in the nightshade family. So the tomato, pepper, potato family. This plant is a resource for specialized pollinators and herbivores, has historical, medicinal, and spiritual uses, and a model wild plant in chemical ecology. So you'll remember, that back in my undergrad days, I worked with chemical ecology. So I have a little bit of a bias for including this plant from my background. And it co-occurs co with the squash. So imagine you are an insect vector flying over on the Borrego or um, any uh, chaparral in Southern California in the hottest part of summer. 
a lot of the grasses are yellowing. They're quite crispy, but these three host plants are bright green, flowering, fruiting at this time of year. All three of these hosts are summer specialists and they senesce and overwinter using large tap roots. So as you're an insect flying overhead, you probably land on these hosts, especially if you're an aphid or a white fly, one of the vectors. So based on this, I predicted that hosts are frequently infected with crop viruses and chronic infections may lead to unusual virus host associations. I also predict that co-infections, so more than one virus and at a time, are common and may be facilitated by virus effects on hosts and vectors. And lastly, important for conservation especially, crop viruses negatively affect wild host performance. So to test my predictions, I worked with three reserves in Southern California. Mott Rimrock, uh, one of the UC natural reserves is the smallest of the three. And it's embedded in patchwork of areas developed mostly for housing and businesses. All three of my target species are present at this relatively small site. Shipley Skinner Reserve, also in Riverside County, like Montrim Rock, is a mid-sized reserve and it's adjacent to housing, wildlands, and ranch land crops. And only two of my target species are present here. Lastly is Anza Borrego Desert State Park. It's the largest California state park. There are roads and development near and in parts of the park, but relative to the other two reserves, there's little adjacent urbanization. And all three species are present, including the humans help that helped me with my project, like Dr. Carrie Mock and my uh, colleague, Jamie Kenny in this picture. So now that we're familiar with the poll situation, I have one last poll. And let me pull, let me activate it. So if you're ready, you should go to the link and I'll go and activate the next poll. So what words come to mind when you think of field research? Heat, <laughs> absolutely. Hat, we wore hats, safety. Yeah, that's important. Rattlesnakes. I did see a few of those. Nets, yeah, if we're collecting insects. Permits, yes, we did get our permits from Anza Borrego Desert State Park, don't worry. <laughs> Nervous PhD advisors. I'm pretty sure my advisor put that. <laughs> okay, I think we got a lot of good. Ooh, one more. Which one is driving? Yes, definitely. Okay, I love all of your answers. Thank you for participating. I will get, ooh, another one came up. I will get back to the talk at hand. So this is how we studied virus communities. We went out into the field, we collected material, we did surveys. Pictured here are uh, a lot of my helpers. So I have my advisor, I have an undergraduate mentor who assisted with this project. I have two grad student colleagues helping me sample. So we, uh, I'll talk more in detail about how we tested the plants for viruses, but here's just an overall uh, sampling of our sampling. Um, we did spend the night at Anza Borrego. Uh, I don't know if you, any of you have been to the reserve, but there's a lovely patio. And every time I go, I take the opportunity to sleep under the stars. So as an undergrad, I came with my ecology course. And I, that was my first time seeing the Milky Way. Uh, before then, I had never seen it. So every time I go, I make sure to sleep under the stars. Um, on the morning that we... We're sampling, I woke up and 
Uh, there were coyotes on the patio with us. So pictured here is a coyote friend from the Anza Borrego Research Center, the UC Reserve. So now back to science. So once we you know, chose and started our project, uh, we had to test our predictions. And for that first prediction, um, which is hosts are frequently infected with crop viruses, we had to find out what viruses are there. To do that, we collected plant tissue for virome discovery. So here I am, once again, with my advisor near the elephant, that might be familiar for Anza Borrego. We are collecting leaf tissue in Ziploc bags that then we stored on dry ice, so ultra cold, before taking it to the lab. Once we got to the lab, we had to extract double-stranded RNA, and that is a unique nucleic acid that's usually only formed by viruses. So we're taking advantage of that to filter out the other nonsense like bacteria and fungus and plant material. We then prepared that for library, uh, for sequencing of club library prep, where with sequencing, you get a printout of virus genetic codes. To read that genetic code, you have to go through um, a software workflow. And here I had Dr. Peng Lin Sun uh, help me with my project. And we worked on this together and it really took off from there. So here are the results. Now I'll go through the slide with you. Um, each bar plot represents a different reserve. And within each reserve, you have each of the three hosts, except at Shipley, there's only two. Within each bar plot, there's all the different colors. Each color represents a different virus. So the takeaway here is that we found at least, there could be more, at least 12 confirmed crop associated viruses in these three target hosts. And all the plants we sampled for this uh, huge sequencing project, which is about 24, all of them were infected with at least one virus. I think, yeah, more than 24. I can't remember anymore. It was a long time ago. Um, Plants are infected uh, with invasive viruses introduced to California from other parts of the world. So you'll notice that there's this one color, that light green, that is uh, the virus called Cabeve, and that is not from California. Um, our research was the first to find it in California. Uh, the same uh, with CYSDV, that one is also not from California and had only been recently reported in the uh, Imperial Valley agriculture in the past two decades. Same with the purple, light purple bar, uh, TOCV. That one also had never been reported in California before. So now that we know what viruses are there, we wanted to test the prediction if these chronic infections may lead to unusual virus host associations. So unlike in agriculture, where the plants are culled at the end of the season, uh, these perennial plants live for a long time and they are collecting potentially interesting viruses that we wouldn't expect. For example, that green bar, cabbage, typically infects cucurbit or squash crops. What we found it in found it infecting that nightshade, the data radii host. And we found that in more than one reserve. Same with uh, tomato chlorosis virus. This one is mostly known as, by the name you would guess, infecting nightshades like tomato, but we did find it in two reserves infecting cucurbita fetidissima. And the same goes for um, tomato necrotic dwarf virus, another one that should only be infecting nightshades, but we found it in our squash host. So two of the viruses that we focused on for the, for the rest of my research are uh, CABI and CYSDV. So you might be a little confused about the naming of viruses. Viruses do have full names, but for the most part, they're referred to by their acronyms, at least these plant viruses. So to test my third prediction, 
working with CABIF and CYFTV, I wanted to find out co-infections are common and may be facilitated by virus effects on hosts and vectors. To do this, we had to sample a lot more plants. So we only visited Anza Borrego in 2019, but we visited the other two reserves, Mott Rim Rock and Shipley Skinner, in 2018, 2019, and 2020. So we, um, all, all three years. To test my prediction, we had to extract nucleic acids from a lot more plants and then perform PCR and sequencing on that plant material. And for this, we're only testing for the two viruses, CABIV and CYSDV. Okay, so here are my results. This seems like a kind of busy slide, um, but let me go over what everything means. So each plot represents a different reserve. Mott Rim Rock and Shipley Skinner are broken down by sampling year. On the y-axis, we have the number of plants sampled. And then on that x, we have uh, what plant species each bar represents. On Zabrego, we only sampled in 2019. We got a lot of plants when we visited. So each color also represents a different virus or combination of virus. So we found that CABIF prevalence among sampled wild cucurbit hosts can be as low as 10%, but to over 90% of plants sampled in an area. We also found that in Anza Borrego, 42% of CABIV infected cucurbita fetidisma and 73% of CABIV infected cucurbita palmata were also infected with CYSDV. So, CYSDV is transmitted by whiteflies, unlike CABYV, CABIV, transmitted by aphids. Both insects are attracted to yellow coloring on leaves, and the symptoms of the viruses in the plants are similar, yellowing of leaves. So uh, we suspect that the yellowing of these squash leaves is attractive to vectors of, of the other virus. So once you have one virus, you as a plant are likely to collect more viruses. So the plants are full of viruses. Does this matter? To answer that question, we're testing the prediction whether crop viruses negatively affect wild host performance. To do this, we focused on CABIV, C-A-B-Y-V. This is the full name of CABIV, Cucurbit aphid-borne yellow virus. We chose this virus because it's the most prevalent across the three reserves, and it has known negative effects on cultivated squash and melon. Here I have pictured uh, an incipient, so the start of an infection on Dixie squash, so like a yellow summer squash you might get at the store, and late stage infection, where the yellowing and the leaves are curling and kind of getting gross on the same plant species. This virus is transmitted by long-term aphid feeding. We are able to take advantage of that by bringing infectious aphids from the field back to the lab for experiments. So we grew seedlings of the two squash plants and uh, infected them experimentally with CABIV, or we used control aphids, clean aphids, to treat them like a mock or control uh, treatment so that we're not just testing for the effect of aphids. So we found that in our greenhouse experiments, CABIV infection reduced shoot and root mass. So we let our plants grow till they were two months old and then we collected the data on their size. So here, the two plots are separated by the mass of shoots or the mass of roots. The y-axis is the mass in grams 
and the X axis indicates which plant species uh, the bars represent. Here, uh, the yellow color, the yellow bars are for cabbage infected plants and green are for mock or sham inoculated plants. So they are not infected with cabbage. Here, I have a picture of two cucurbita palmata, two month old seedlings. Which one do you think is infected with cabbage? So they're just, I just took their vines and stretched them out across the ground. If you guessed the one on the left is infected, you're correct. The one on the left was cabbage infected and the one on the right is a control plant. Here is a picture from the 70s of a researcher with a four year old cucurbita fetidissima root. So as I mentioned earlier, these plants overwinter. They rely on their roots to store water and nutrients so that they can regrow around April or May every year. Um, however, we found that cabbage infection reduces the size, the mass of the roots, especially in cucurbita fetidissima. So one season we have a difference in uh, maybe 25% for just two months, but that can compound every year because these plants live for potentially decades. So a plant infected with a virus may um, really be at a disadvantage compared to an uninfected plant. But note that nearly all the plants we found were infected, at least at some places. So as a take home message, I want you all to have learned that viruses from agriculture are spilling over into wild plants. Most wild plants sampled are infected with multiple crop viruses. These crop viruses can reduce plant growth and affect long-term survival, but the species we investigated are persisting and may be finding ways to cope with virus infection. Remember the story of the pumpkin plants that are infected with virus have a, an advantage where they are less likely to contract a bacterial pathogen. Potentially in a field context, viruses could be conferring benefits that outweigh costs. Only investment in future research will solve these mysteries. So with that, I'd love to acknowledge my lab, all the people that trained me and assisted me, as well as my funding sources, uh, especially my advisor and the Anza Borrego Foundation. So if, with that, I'd love to end with any questions or comments. I know that Samantha's gonna um, do all of that for us. So thank you so much. Um, here, I'm leaving it at this slide for now and um, I'll let Samantha take over. Thanks, Tessa. Let me pull up my notes. Um, just wanna make sure to say all the things. Um, <clears throat> that was really cool. I learned a lot, thanks. Um, sorry, one second. Um, <clears throat> yeah, okay. So um, we already had one person type a question into the Q&A, but if there are others, other questions that have come up or you might be holding on to, um, <clears throat> please type them into the Q&A. I have also opened up the chat, so I, I figured out how to enable it. Um, so uh, you could also just chat if you'd like, um, but the Q&A pops up for me and Tessa and Carrie. And so we can, we'll answer those live in just a minute. Um, so as people are gathering their questions, I just quickly want to address the things on this slide, um, which are, um, sorry. Okay, so um, a couple of things you see on our slide, a um, an image of the state park store. So Anza Brego Foundation runs the state park store, which is found both inside the visitor center. So you might, if you've been to the visitor center, then you've seen our store, as well as our second location, which is in the mall in Brego Springs. And all of those proceeds 
from the store, from your purchases, go to support education programs, go directly back into the organization and into education. Uh, so you, if you're not in Borrego Springs, though, you can also go to our website and uh, buy, make some purchases online. Um, let's see. What else do I want to say? I see some, there's one question coming up. Let's go back um, really quick. Tessa, do you see that in the answered tab? Someone had a question, can plant viruses exist in the ground and then affect plants that are planted later? And Carrie responded via text, but I think it could also be helpful just to share the response verbally. Okay. Um... I could read Carrie's answer out loud, uh, but generally, so the question was if they can exist in the ground and infect plants that are planted later. And the answer is yes. It really depends on the mechanism. So how that plant virus is transmitted. Some are not transmitted by insects, but mechanically by rubbing. So if you have um, cutting shears that get, uh, infected plant virus sap on them and then you go cut another plant you can transmit the virus um so virus particles can be transmitted that way some viruses can persist in the soil a long time some can be transmitted by nematodes or by fungi so these viruses are really diverse have a lot of ways to get around and um find uh, a host really um, for me, I really focused on those plant transmitted viruses, but we did find in our sequencing viruses that may have been fungal infecting or um, more mutualist plant viruses. They're previously undescribed, so they're beyond the scope of my plant virus insect vector system, but we did find viruses that maybe aren't insect transmitted but are um, like passed from mother to you know offspring through seed seed born. So there's a lot of cool stuff. Thanks. Uh, somebody also asked, is there a treatment for these viruses to help a plant recover? Right now, there is no treatment for virus infection in these plants. I think with citrus, there's some kind of um, way you can treat your, your plant with heat to get rid of the virus. But generally, for the regular person, me and you with our gardens, um, even agriculture, like large scale, once, you're, once the plant is infected, there is no cure. There is no vaccine. Um, as for the mechanically transmitted viruses, uh, being sanitary with your tools, and um, maintaining clean, like virus-free systems will protect. But as far as the insect transmitted viruses, sometimes all it takes is one aphid. Um, some virus, like some insects, some aphids, they just need to just probe, just taste the plant a couple of times, depending on the virus and um, transmission occurs. The viruses I worked with required long-term feeding, so like a day to two days of feeding to transmit, but some of them, it just probe and go. That's my favorite thing to say. <laughs> probe and go. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, um, and then I, I see there's a question, what are the next steps in the project? Well. I think that's something that Carrie will have to answer because she's the one where all the uh, materials are. <laughs> yeah, um, so one of the fun things that we wanna think about next is, you know, these are plants that had been out in the field for a long time, but if we were to put our own plants out there that we grew in the greenhouse, for instance, um, same species that Tessa work with, but ones that, you know, we're putting out all at the same time, uh, what kind of virus communities would they accumulate over time? So like who comes in first, who comes in second, 
And how does who gets there first influence the subsequent viruses that colonize those plants? Um, and we might also, with that approach, be able to see if the region, certain regions of the, the range of these plants are um, you know, more prone to these vir virus accumulations than others, um, and start to understand how um, the viruses might be impacting these plants' health in a field context. Um, the other cool thing that we want to do is to understand um, how long these plants have been dealing with these viruses. And uh, one way we can do that is to go look at herbarium specimens. And so you can actually recover viral DNA or RNA. Those are the, the molecules that make up the genetic material uh, from historical specimens, even back to like 100 years ago. So as Tessa mentioned, a lot of these viruses are introduced to California. Um, and that means that they, uh, in many cases, came from as far away as Europe or Asia. You know, so we're talking like huge geographical differences between <laughs> these, these, you know, these areas. Um, and we want to reconstruct the history of invasion of these viruses into these wild plant communities especially in how that corresponds with the history of agriculture in California. Harry, you were starting to actually touch on that next question we received, and it's referring to when we say a virus is not native to California, are we talking about a geopolitical or natural boundary? I think we're really talking about a natural boundary because some of these viruses they were first described in, let's say Cabi was first described in France, and comes from that, um, that hemisphere of the earth rather than in the Americas. So a lot of these viruses are not from this region. Um, so that, that's a more of a natural boundary. I hope that answered your question, Omar. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? I have a question to the audience. I don't know if they can do like um, a reaction or something. I would love to know if anyone learned something they didn't know before or if they were surprised. What can Boregans do to prevent further damage? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. I'm not 100% sure. I guess there's, if you take care of, if you have like a home garden, if you start to see your plants have wilting or they're yellow, uh, color your plants, but there's not much you can do because you don't really know what infections, if any, your plants have, because sometimes viral infections have similar symptoms or signs to say a nutrient deficiency in a plant. So it, it may be hard to know if you are contributing to damage at all. More broadly though, there are good phytosanitary practices that people can, can take on. So, um, you know, like not, not moving plants between other states in California, um, not moving plants like vast distances, even within California, it's a really big state, not bringing plants across borders from one country to another. So there's lots of ways that, you know, we as individuals can, um, you know, keep track of the plants and, that we're moving around and be cognizant of the ways that these things might be carrying some unwanted guests with them. Hitchhikers. Yeah, hitchhikers. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I see someone in the, Ted responding in the chat to your question, Tessa. Um, so said, I had no idea there's so many different plant viruses and how common they are. They explain the stunted growth of my zucchini squash. Yes, that could. Um, they are really common. When we first started 
uh, my project, we'd go out to like the garden at UC Riverside and we would actually look for symptoms in people's zucchini and watermelon, just kind of for fun, just to survey. Mm -hmm. Fun. Yeah, plants can be co-infected, which is pretty, pretty surprising. Yeah. And then Julia, Julia said that it's wild that viruses or squashes could also infect tomato type plants and the reverse. Yes. So it shows that if we only study crop plants or annual plants or only study, you know, one type of plant, we're only going to hear or find out half the story. So studying these perennials uh, led to a lot of insight into plant virus interactions. Yeah, thanks for your comments, Cindy. There is um, a lot more connection between our agriculture and our wild systems. It's, it's the indirect interactions that get you. And viruses previously weren't studied in the ecological context because they're so diverse and hard to identify even using sequencing tools. Now, the materials, it's, the science has really advanced. So we were able to leverage new techniques to find viruses. But previously you had to ask, does it have this virus or that virus? And if you can only ask one virus at a time, you kind of miss all the other options. So um, yeah, with new technology, we can find a lot more answers, but that leaves us with a lot more questions too. I, yeah, this, I, this is, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, well, I was going to ask actually, I'm, I don't know if you said this, I don't think you said this, but like, but can you just test for presence, absence of viruses, say that you don't know what the virus is at all, right? And it's something that you've never heard of before, but you know, just to see if there's a virus there. Yeah, that's kind of what we did um, with the approach for finding these viruses. And Tessa mentioned that we extracted something called double-stranded RNA. And most organisms don't have double-stranded RNA. So this is like the little message that your cell uses to make proteins. It exists as one, one, one half of a piece, right? And then if it has the other half lined up next to it, it's double-stranded. And we don't make that stuff and plants don't make that stuff. So if you just extract this double-stranded RNA, you can visualize that and see if something is there. And if it shows up, then you know that there's a virus in there somewhere. So in the olden days, this was how people could determine if at least some symptoms in a plant were um, associated with um, the presence of a virus, right? Because you could take this stuff out of the plant and visualize it pretty easily. And it's only now that we have the technology to read the genetic code in all that double-stranded RNA, um, you know, with, without knowing what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's more questions. Yeah, another question popped up. Ooh. Ooh. That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. There's not... I don't think the question is do non native viruses outcompete the native viruses in the wild plants or that is reduce the presence of native native viruses That is a really challenging question. I feel like you'd be a really good um, <laughs> exam giver for PhD students. Yeah, and a good <laughs> ecologist. It is a, it's a great question. Um I mean I I think that's something we could explore further with the these um, sort of novel viruses that we found. So we find them in almost all of the plants that we sample. Um, and one of the things that we have to determine is whether uh, they are plant infecting or whether they're just infecting a fungus that happens to be living on the plant and plants have lots of fungi on them, just like they have lots of viruses. So we have a few that seem to be like uh, plant infecting. And if we could um, develop techniques to measure how much of that virus is in the plant, we could then infect the plant with these non-native viruses 
um, and then measure how that affects the viruses that are living kind of in symbiosis with these native plants. That's one approach. Um, how many other California native plants might be suffering from viral infections? Do you know if anyone has been or currently working on researching these viruses in other California native plants? So we know of at least, maybe Terry knows more, but I know of at least one group or one uh, professor we collaborate with and she does work in more central California on grasses. So that's that grassland um, multi-year reduction in survival and fitness that I cited. So for sure, people are working on grasses. Um, but as far as other uh, California native plants. Um, Ours is the first study to look at anything that's not a grass, as far as I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. We might be pretty unique in that regard, at least within California. Uh, I know that in other countries, for example, Finland or Sweden, they did um, a, a sequencing study. Same with uh, South Africa and France. They found that, at least in South Africa and France, that agriculture, the proximity to agriculture uh, had more viruses in these wild plants. Um, but yeah, I don't know about California. Yeah, a lot of the work in California is really focused on the ag side because we, we grow like 50% of the fruits and vegetables that are eaten in the entire country. So, and a bunch that are exported. <laughs> so there's a lot of focus on that, that side of things. But clearly from our study, I think we need to do a little more digging on how the, these you know, agricultural activities might be spilling over to influence wild communities. Even whether or not we can you know, come up with ways to mitigate it, I think it's an important part of um, how those plants are having to deal with all of the changes to our environment that are happening right now. I'd like to take a moment to plug um, my colleague or my, the other grad student in Carrie's lab, Jamie, uh, is doing work not on plant viruses, but bacteria in wild California native plants, uh, in nightshade especially. So uh, that one's also insect transmitted, but not by aphids, by psyllids. Uh, so that's another angle you can even look for bacteria outside of agriculture. Great. Thanks. Are there any other questions or comments? All righty. Well, um, yeah, I just, I also want to say thank you. Uh, thanks, Carrie, for writing that in the chat, but thank you to Tessa presenting and Carrie for being here as well and how, helping to field some questions. And then also thank you to all of our webinar attendees. Um, we, every, if you purchased a ticket or if you are a student, um, we would love to have you, but all, all registrations, all tickets go to support the other future education programs coming right back into the organization. Um, if you feel called to uh, support the work we do further, I am pasting a link in the chat um, to donate. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. And so everything that we do is funded by donations, grants, um, or program registrations. Um, I think that's all. Oh, I do want to just plug our next webinar. So if you're interested, if you if you like to just pop in on a weeknight and hear about some interesting research happening in San Diego and in Anza Borrego Desert State Park, our next webinar will be on July 27th. And it's all about the state of insect biodiversity across California. So we have a an entomologist from the San Diego Natural History Museum 
talking about a really cool statewide collaboration looking at insect biodiversity. Very cool. Uh, yeah, I, I want to go to that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it should be really cool. It's um, um, yeah, we we're about to post the registration page where you can read the information about it. Great. Um, also, if you are not a member of ABF, and um, let me go back, uh, and you want and you want to hear about future events, you can. I just posted a poll. Um, you can just click contact me in your poll response and I'll reach out to you. I should be able to capture who is responding. I hope so. I'm assuming I can capture who is responding. <laughs> Otherwise, feel free to just email me if you don't hear from me in a while. My email address is samantha at the abf.org. And I'm typing that in the chat right now. Um, any other thoughts, Tessa or Carrie? No, just thank you for inviting and giving us the opportunity to share our research on Anza Borrego. And thank you everyone for your participation. Yeah, this was really fun. Yeah, I had a great time. Thanks. Um, and thanks. hopefully you all look for plant viruses next time you take a hike in Anza Borrego. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I know that after seeing those, hearing your talk and seeing those images, I'm definitely going to look at plants with a new lens looking for yes. viruses. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're around. Reach out to us if you need anything. And um, we'll see you at the next program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.